everyone. Today I'm going to be showing you how to make some show-stopping Christmas desserts. Now, I don't know about you, but Christmas pudding, the sort of classic one with brandy sauce, not really for me. So I like to find creative ways to get those Christmassy pudding flavors into a dessert without eating the Christmas pudding itself. And one of the best recipes I know to do this on Cookie Do is our baked Christmas pudding cheesecake. It is absolutely delicious and it's quite a bit lighter than the traditional pudding with custard and all of that. So it's a nice one to have at dinner and then to last you through the next few days so that you can keep that Christmas spirit going. Another favorite of mine, if you want to kind of veer away from the traditional mince pie, is our meringue topped mince pies. Now these are really lovely and really fun to make. You can have a lot of fun with piping the meringue on top in whatever shapes or styles you want to. And then I've got a handy little blowtorch to torch the top of mine to toast the marshmallow, but you can also just pop them into the oven. So both of these recipes are slightly time consuming, not for effort that you're going to make, but in terms of needing to bake or sit in the fridge or chill or get hot, whatever it is. So we're going to be doing them in stages, kind of switching between the two as we go along. So first of all, because our pastry for our mince pies needs to chill, we're going to make that first. Now, short crust pastry could not be any easier. It's literally four basic ingredients. You've got your plain flour in there. You've got cold unsalted butter. A little bit of sugar for sweetening, and if you were making a savory tart, you would obviously leave that out. And egg. And then I always, even for my sweet pastry, add a pinch of salt. Salt in these kinds of things doesn't actually lend any kind of savory flavor. It just sort of brings out the other flavors in whatever you're making. So first of all, flour, butter, sugar, and salt are gonna be mixed for about 10 seconds at speed eight until they're nice and combined. And then you might have heard people say that when you blend together this initial flour butter mixture, you're looking for breadcrumb texture. And all that means is that your butter is evenly incorporated into your flour like that. So it has the consistency of fine breadcrumbs, or actually it looks more reminiscent of ground almonds to me. But regardless, that's what you're looking for. Now you're going to add in your egg. If you want an enriched dough, like a really rich yellow dough, you could just use two egg yolks instead of one whole egg. Make sure they're small egg yolks in that case. And that's gonna be mixed together for about 20 seconds at speed four, just until it forms a lovely cohesive dough. There we go. Now we're going to tip that out either onto some reusable beeswax wrap or a piece of cling film if that's what you've got handy. That's exactly what you're looking for in terms of texture and color. Obviously, if you use beautiful, high quality, free range, organic eggs, the yolks are gonna be that gorgeous, rich orange and give your dough that special, beautiful, bright yellow color. So there we go. And now golden rule of pastry is you want to transfer as little heat as possible to the pastry with your hands. So I usually put mine in the center of my reusable wrap or my cling film. I wrap it up like this. And then from the outside of the cling film, I bring it together into the shape of sort of like a hockey puck. And all you're doing is looking to smooth out the edges so that there aren't any visible cracks because that will make it harder to roll out later. And into a nice circle, very simple. And there it is, beautiful, bright yellow, rich pastry dough ready for our mince pies. This is gonna go into the fridge to chill for about 30 minutes or until just firm. And we're going to get started on our baked cheesecake. So I'm not sure about you, but I far prefer a baked cheesecake to a fridge cheesecake. I find the texture so much more velvety and appealing. And with Thermomix, baked cheesecake, beautiful smooth mixture, zero effort. First of all, what you're going to want to do the day before you make your cheesecake is soak your mixed fruit in brandy. Whatever brandy you prefer, I think you could also use anything else you like in terms of spirits. You could use port, sherry, whatever it is, I use some brandy. And here I've got sultanas, mixed peel, and raisins. This already smells like Christmas to me. Now, the recipe does say that you should drain your fruit through a sieve, but because I can see I don't really have that much brandy left, I'm just gonna gently pour it off, like so. Because having a little bit left over to go into our cheesecake mixture isn't the end of the world. We just don't want too much because that will make our mixture too 
wet and runny. So make sure that's done and set it aside. And now we're going to make our ginger nut biscuit and digestive crust. So equal amounts of digestive biscuits and ginger nut biscuits. Two of my favorite kinds of biscuits to dip in tea, but also they make a beautiful cheesecake crust. And we're just gonna blitz that up until it has a lovely sort of thick, chunky breadcrumb texture. And you can immediately hear when that's done because it goes from this like very loud whizzing chopping sound to very smooth. And then you can always take a look and see if you've got any pieces left. So as we can see, I've got this one random digestive, which I'm just gonna put aside. And now we're gonna transfer our beautiful crust crumb to a bowl. And now we're going to melt our butter to start putting our mixture for the crumb base together. So very importantly, you never want to add too much butter to your biscuit crumb mixture for a cheesecake base because it becomes quite greasy and it doesn't hold its shape in the base of your tin. So we're just gonna melt that at about 50 degrees, just until it's ready. Okay, so our butter's melted, and now we're going to put our lovely biscuit crumb in with our butter and just mix that together until just combined. You want it to be well combined, but you want the butter to sort of be incorporated throughout the biscuit in a way that isn't sort of claggy, but you'll see what I mean. So that's exactly what we're looking for in terms of texture, that butter's well incorporated. And now we're going to put that into the base of my cake tin. Good. You could also make this recipe into adorable individual cheesecakes if you have appropriate baking vessels. And then you can use a spatula, but I find it much easier to use a tablespoon for this. So what you're gonna do is you sort of shake it out until the mixture is covering the base. And then using your spoon, you're just gonna smooth it out. So don't start pressing straight away. You're just looking for an even amount of filling all the way around the base. You don't want some parts of the, the, the base that are gonna be much thicker than others. So you're just gonna do this. And then once you've got it evenly incorporated, then you're gonna press it down so that it gets nice and firm. So this is probably as smooth and compact as I'm going to get it. And now we're going to chill this in the fridge for 15 minutes. And meanwhile, we will make our cheesecake filling and you should be preheating your oven to 140. You want a nice low heat for cheesecake to get that silky smooth uncracked finish. So this is going into the fridge and then I'll be back. Okay, so our base for our cheesecake is chilling in the fridge and now we're going to make the filling. So first things first, your golden caster sugar is going in and we're going to grind that for about 10 seconds at speed nine. And now we're going to go in with all the rest of our filling ingredients. So that is full fat cream cheese. This is not a recipe to skimp on calories, just go all in. I have made this recipe using a mixture of mascarpone and ricotta before, and that's also lovely. You can add some sour cream if you like that sort of tang in your cheesecake, which I definitely do. So going in with our cream cheese, all of that's going in there. And then three eggs. And our soaked fruit with its brandy is going in as well. The thing that I usually struggle with with cheesecakes when I'm not making them with my Thermomix, which I don't really do anymore, but when I used to, is that often your mixture can sort of split if your cream cheese and your eggs are not incorporated at the right temperature, at the right time, at the right speed, whatever it is. But Thermomix takes care of all of that for you and you will get a silky smooth, completely coagulated result every time. So mixed spice, ultimate Christmas flavor, orange zest, you could use clementines here, and our soaked fruit with its brandy, yum. And now we're just gonna mix that together for about two minutes, just until it's well incorporated. So our cheesecake mixture is ready and our base is lovely and chilled. And now all we're going to do is pour this luxurious cheesecake mixture on top of our base. And then we're just gonna sort of give the mixture a little bit of a stir to make sure that all of that lovely brandy soaked fruit is evenly distributed around the cheesecake. Mm, this smells so festive. I might lick the spatula later, but you'll never know. 
And at this point, it might seem quite liquid, but it will set up beautifully in the oven. And you're going to want to bake it for about an hour, hour and 15 in your 140 degree preheated oven. And what you're looking for when it's done is a slight wobble. So we always call it a set wobble, which sounds contradictory, but it does make sense. And all you do is you gently, using your oven gloves obviously at this point, give the tin a bit of a shake. And what you want is for all of the edges to be firm and you just want a slight wobble right in the center. And that's when you know your cheesecake is ready. So we're gonna pop that in the oven and then we're gonna roll out our pastry for our mince pies. So our pastry has been chilled for our mince pies. We're just gonna generously flour our worktop and our rolling pin. Very important to flour both. And then take your pastry, pop it down on the counter. And now, first of all, we start with ridging, which is this gentle pressing motion. It just softens up the dough slightly after being in the fridge. And then we can roll it out. So we just want it to be nice and thin. Whenever you're thinking about how thick you want your pastry, think about it in terms of relative to the size of the vessel that you're putting it in. So we're using these tiny little muffin tart cases. So we want our pastry very thin because if it's thick, then you're just gonna get a massive mouthful of heavy pastry. You want lovely, delicate, thin pastry to surround your mince pie filling. There are lots of rolling techniques that you can use, but I always say just do the one that you are most comfortable with. I usually go clockwise around, starting from the center of my clock and going up and then to three o'clock and then to six o'clock and then to nine o'clock. And if your pastry does start to crack, don't panic, just gently press it together and go up. And then another really important thing with pastry that I think a lot of people, well, puts a lot of people off is that they, it starts to fall apart, it starts to crack, pieces break off and they just think this is it. It's, it's, all, it's all gone to hell, there's nothing I can do to save it but you always can bring it back. If it does start to feel too soft, breaking apart, just pop it back in the fridge to firm up for a while and then come back to it. So never any need to panic. I've got my cookie cutter and what you want for your cookie cutter for this recipe is for it to be just slightly bigger than each of your individual muffin holes in your muffin tin. I'll show you what I mean in a second. As you can see, this is what I've chosen and it comfortably fits over the top of each muffin hole and there's a bit extra and I'll show you why. So starting at the edge, just cut one out and then what you're going to do is you're going to fit it in gently and then press up the sides. So don't be afraid to manhandle it a little bit. You want it pressed evenly up the sides. You don't really need an overhang here because it is just needs to be high enough that you can fill it with a bit of your mince pie filling. But you do want it neatly pressed around the edges, just like that. And we're just gonna repeat that for the remainder of our dough and then I'll come back to show you what to do next. So our tart cases are beautifully lined, very nice and easy. And now we're going in with our mince filling. So just a generous, about a tablespoon in each one and then top it up with whatever you have left. And you want your oven preheated at 180 for this one. And what we're gonna do is once our mince pie filling is in, we are going to bake these for about 15 minutes. And while they're baking, we are going to make our delicious meringue topping. Now I've managed to get 12 mince pies out of this recipe, but you might get more or less depending on the size of your muffin tin holes. So now we're just going back, filling up the ones that were slightly more empty, and then into the oven for 15 minutes, and I will see you in a minute to make our meringue. Now it's time to make our meringue for our mince pies. So I've got my butterfly whisk inserted, going in with my three egg whites, and then you never set a specific time for meringue. You just remove your measuring cup, go to speed three, and you just keep an eye on it, and you watch until stiff peaks form. And I'll show you what that looks like when we get there. So that's pretty much what we're looking for. It's holding its shape, and if we gave the mixing bowl a shake, or even, we're not going to, but turned it upside down, nothing would budge. Now, again, set to speed three, leave that measuring cup off, and we're slowly going to pour in 150 grams 
of gold and caster sugar. Making sure to do it about one to two tablespoons at a time and giving the mixture time to go back to stiff peaks between each addition of sugar. This is especially important for the first few additions. You want a really lovely thick mixture so that it's perfectly pipable. While that's going on, make sure that you have your piping bag ready with your piping nozzle. I've got a lovely star-shaped nozzle because I want to pipe little stars of meringue on top of my mince pies. Almost there. And you'll see the volume of meringue start to increase and expand as you incorporate the sugar. It might seem like a lot of sugar for three egg whites, but it is vital that you use the full amount specified in the recipe. If you don't have golden caster sugar, normal white caster sugar will work perfectly well. And with the last bit of my sugar in, I'm just gonna give it a few more seconds just to come together beautifully. I can see it's really thick and velvety in there. That looks delightful. So, let's see. There we go. Lovely, thick, glossy meringue. Remove your butterfly whisk. Just make sure you get all of that meringue off of the butterfly whisk. And now we're going to put it into our piping bag. So the best way to do this is to grab a jug or any kind of vessel that you can fit your piping bag into, like so. And you tuck that in neatly. And then all we're going to do is using whatever you've got handy, we're going to scoop that meringue into our piping bag from the mixing bowl. So I'm just gonna put the rest of this in here and then I'll show you the next step. So now my meringue's in there, here's another good tip. Make sure you fold back up the edge that you folded over. And now you can see there's that gap between the meringue and the bottom of the piping bag. Hold the top very firmly and just give it a little whirl. And that encourages all of your mixture to go to the bottom of the bag perfectly. Squeeze any remaining air out, tie a little knot at the top, and you are ready to pipe. You're just gonna snip off the edge down here, and we'll get our mince pies and start piping. One of my best pieces of advice when working with pastry is to get yourself a range of different sizes of palette knives. So I've got a nice long one, which helps you to kind of gently scrape pastry away from the surface of a tartan or on a worktop if it starts to get stuck without breaking it. And these little ones are ideal for stuff like this, where you need to very deftly and delicately remove little tarts from cases. So just work your way around the edge and then gently slide underneath and it should come out very easily. And I'm just gonna get the rest of these out of the muffin tins and then we're going to pipe on our meringue. Great, so now we've got our mince pies arranged on their plate and now we're going to pipe on our meringue. So like I said, I'm just gonna do little stars all the way around. You can do any shape or pattern you like. And then we're going to get out one of my favorite kitchen toys, my blowtorch. Or you would just put them back on a baking tray, flat baking tray, and bake them in the oven for five minutes until the meringue is lightly brown. And once you've torched your meringue, just leave the mince pies to stand for about five minutes so they're not too scaldingly hot, and then serve them to your very grateful friends and family. Preferably with a glass of mulled wine from my previous video. These look like the most adorable little meringue kisses. Reminds me of Bake Off. Okay, so, beautifully piped meringue, blowtorch. And if you are using a blowtorch, make sure it works. There we go. And very gently, I think a lot of people make the mistake of going too hard with their blowtorch. And you just, you don't need to get too close to your meringue. You're just close enough to just torch the edges. And you can go back and do a bit more, but you can never undo too much damage. So be very gentle to start. Love handling flame live on camera. If you've never used a blowtorch before, make sure to practice before trying it for a recipe that you're counting on working to serve friends and family. But once you get the hang of it, they could not be easier to use. So I've torched them all a little bit, and now I'm going back and I'm just doing the edges that I missed before. There we go. 
And it's okay if the little tips of the meringue kisses are singed. It gives that lovely fireside toasted marshmallow flavor. And there we go. Couldn't be simpler. So now we're going to leave these to cool for a bit and then we're going to get our taste tester on to give it a try. So I've managed to find the one person in the office who has never had a mince pie before. Mac is here to give us his honest opinion live on camera about what he thinks of our meringue topped mince pies. Mac, do you want to come over? Thank you for coming on. Hiya, thanks for are having you, me. Are you ready to give this a try? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. This is an experiment. First time for everything. Absolutely. Take a bite. See what you think. Honest right. opinions always welcome on my videos. It smells really nice. Mm. You expect meringue on that. I know. It's like a little unique touch. Oh my god. Yeah? Are you a fan? <laughs> it's really nice. Yay! I love the bit, surprise tone. It's a, it's a bit still hot on the inside, but it's so lovely. Oh, amazing. I'm so glad you like it. Do you want to take the rest back to eat at your desk? Absolutely. Thank you for coming to taste test for me. It's really nice. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mac. Okay, everyone. So I'm going to go eat a mince pie myself because I've just taken our cheesecake out of the oven. It now needs to sit until it's room temperature and then go into the fridge until completely chilled before we can taste test that. So I'll see you soon for a delicious cheesecake taste test. I'm back with my beautiful Christmas pudding baked cheesecake. I let it set outside of the oven until it was at room temperature and then I transferred it over to the fridge to chill completely. Now, if you're not under any time pressure, my top tip for any baked cheesecake is once your baking time has finished, turn the oven off, open the door of the oven ajar and leave your cheesecake in there until the oven is completely cold. This gives you the smoothest, least likely to crack surface on your cheesecake. And it means that the inside will be perfectly uniform in texture and then transfer it over the to the fridge to chill overnight. But due to our time constraints, I've done the best I could. It's here, it's beautiful. I've sprinkled some chocolate flakes on top just to finish it. I'm gonna cut a slice and then I'm going to call in our wonderful videographer, Zach, to come and try it. Zach has been the mastermind behind all of our recent videos since about June. And I'm sure you've all noticed the brilliant quality of our videos lately, and it's all thanks to him. So he really does deserve a beautiful slice of cheesecake, if anyone does. Zach? Wow, mastermind's a very bold word, I'd say. Well, I think, I think you know, people have noticed the difference. Mmm. It's very Christmassy. I have very to say really. that you get the Christmas pudding flavor. I've not tried this before either. Mmm. Mm. Really good. Really nice texture. Very smooth, isn't it? Yeah, really smooth. Yeah? Yeah. Would you have that as your showstopper Christmas dessert? I actually would, yeah. I really would. That's high praise from Zach. He's a notoriously fussy eater. Sometimes. <laughs> Thank you so much for cool. trying it. I'm going to take this and finish this behind the camera. Please do. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'm going to see all of you again next week for some delicious ideas of what to do with your Christmas leftovers. Nothing goes to waste in my kitchen and nothing needs to go to waste in yours either. So I'll be giving you some ideas of how to use your leftover turkey, gammon, roast veg, all your odds and ends. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you next week.